one, but I was wrong. Temptation surrounds us at every turn, inviting us to take just a little more. More food, more money, more power, more life. What could it hurt, we hear on television, from friends, and in our own souls? More suffering, more hunger, more need, more fear, more anger. So we gather today in worship to hear the consequences of more and to celebrate that we do not need more when we have everything in Christ. Beloved of God, let us drink deeply from the wellspring of God's spirit, which has all we need to live fully, love deeply, and serve faithfully. Thanks be to God. During the season of this is two, 15 through 17, and it's on the screen. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work which he had done, and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all his work which he had done in creation. And the second one is uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said, he said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the gar garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. To be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their heads they will bear you up. Sorry. <laughs> so you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan! For it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only Him.
running with the devil in the ways that we shouldn't be. We are just running with the devil. And the devil is creating havoc this morning, yeah. We're running with the devil. All of us are running with the devil at one time or another. You know what it's like, that running with the devil. That it feels like that no matter how hard we try to do the right thing, that we can get caught up, we can get intrigued, we can get deceived by something that we know is not good for us. But we do it anyway, and later on we say, oh, why did that happen? Why did that have to happen? Running with the devil. It's trying to be strong, to stay in the spirit of God, to live by the power of Christ. And on some days we can do it so well. We can outpace the devil. We can leave the devil behind. But on other days we're weak. We just can't do it. Because we're running with the devil. That's what temptation is like. It can be something that you experience yourself as very real, or it can be a metaphor for that chaos and confusion that takes over our emotions, that takes over our thoughts and takes over our actions, and we find ourselves doing things that are wrong, are stupid, are hurtful to ourselves and to others. Jesus was running with the devil. That's what the scripture was about. It was about when Jesus was running with the devil. You remember how it all happened. Because Jesus had just been baptized by the Holy Spirit. He'd been baptized with John and the Holy Spirit came down and had said, This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we don't know what happened. It says in the scripture he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Maybe he was afraid. All of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, so much is going to be expected of me. I'm not up to it. Maybe he was confused. Not sure quite what I'm supposed to do. Maybe he wasn't afraid or confused, but he just needed to take some time away to be fully with God. So there he was running with the devil, and you remember what it said. After he'd fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil came to him, and the devil said, Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, You know, we don't live by bread alone. We live by the word of God that comes to us. The devil put an economic temptation in front of Jesus. The temptation of resources, of meeting all of our needs so easily and carefully. That temptation to meet our needs above other needs. To meet our needs ahead of what God wants from us. And then the devil came to Jesus and put him up on a pinnacle. And he said, jump off. Because you know the angels were going to catch you when you jump off. And Jesus said, Do not put your Lord God to the test. And that was a temptation of spiritual power. He was tempted to do something amazing and miraculous. Not because God wanted him to do it, but so he could get praise and adulation. And so everybody would look and say, wow, what an amazing person. That temptation for praise and adulation. And then the devil came to him a third time. And what did he say? He said, uh, he put him up in a mountain and he showed him all kingdoms of the world. Look at all the kingdoms of the world. And 
that they will all belong to you. You'll rule over them all if you just worship me. And Jesus said, we're only supposed to worship God. I'm not going to worship you. And he said, go away, Satan. Get out of here. Get thee away from me. Get thee behind me, Satan. I don't need you. And so it says, Satan left and the angels tended to Jesus. And you know, we think of these temptations that Jesus faced as something that, you know, we're not really tempted by. I mean, really, I'm not tempted to turn these stones to bread because I know I couldn't or to rule all the kingdoms of the world, or to jump off a mountain to prove, you know, how spiritually powerful I am. But they represent temptations that we do face. And the temptations that we face are putting money, resources ahead of everything else. Just thinking, oh, if I had this amount, or if I had that amount, everything would be great. Having that as our goal instead of living the lives we know we ought to live. Or the temptation of having everyone think what a wonderful person we are and doing things so that people will think we're great. In the scriptures, it talks about Jesus jumping off the pinnacle and the angels catching him. But for us, that's the temptation. You know, to do something great, not because we're going to serve God, but to look around. You know, who, did anybody notice what I did? Yeah, I was, whatever it was. And the third temptation, you know, that temptation of political power. And, and we have that temptation, too, to have the chance to lord it over someone else, to be right when they're wrong, or to just get somebody else to do what we want them to, to do rather than what maybe they should be doing. And so if we put any of these things ahead of God, anything goes ahead of God, then... We're going to be in a worse place instead of a better place. And I'll tell you what, the reason it's called a temptation isn't because we look at it and we think, oh, that's a terrible thing to do. But it's because we look at it and we think, well, that would be great. And it wouldn't be really that bad. You know, the temptations that we look at and we think, oh, that's a terrible thing to do. I'm not going to do that. And those aren't temptations at all. There was a guy and he died and he went before St. Peter and St. Peter said to him, I'm going to let you choose whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. He's like, all right. St. Peter says, you can visit each place and then you can decide. So first he went down to hell and I mean, he liked it because it wasn't 14 degrees. It was like really warm there. He was like, yeah, this is great. And there were people like laughing hysterically and looked like they were partying, wild music and Oh, that's pretty cool. He goes up to heaven. It's quiet and peaceful and there's a lot of love around and people aren't raising their voices at each other, but, you know, they're just enjoying each other's company. And so he goes to St. Peter and he said, I've decided. And St. Peter says, all right, what did you decide? And he says, well, heaven is beautiful and it's so peaceful and I know that it's a wonderful place. But he said, I think I get bored there pretty quick. And besides, you know, hell is so nice and warm. So I think I'm going to choose that. And so St. Peter says, all right, your choice. And so he goes there. And he gets there, and there's fire all over the place. And he can hear people's screams. And Satan is beating people. And he stands in front of Satan. And he said, hey, what happened to the party and everything that was going on yesterday? And Satan says, oh, that was just a screensaver. So... That's the thing, you know, it's, it's the false image of happiness. That's what temptation gives us. It deceives us into thinking, this is going to be great if I do that, or it'll be so satisfying if I do it. But it isn't true. It will lead us to a different place than we want to go. There was an article in the Connecticut Post not too long ago. The headline of the article said, 
treasurer of the PTO embezzles $30,000 and will get three years in jail. And you look at that and you think, no one who's treasurer of the PTO would ever do something like that. Would they? I mean, of course not. They would never do that. But the backstory is a little more complicated. I mean, the treasurer was having financial difficulty and the bill for her trash was sitting on her table and she couldn't pay it. And there was all this money in the PTO account that they weren't using, they weren't spending. And she thought, you know, part of my trash is from all this work I do for the PTO. And so I'm just going to pay it with this debit card, which she did. And since she paid the bills and didn't get caught, she thought, all right, that's working out just fine. So the next month, she didn't have quite enough money for her groceries. And she thought to herself, well, I think the people would want me to eat. And look, they have all this money and they're not even using it. So she used her debit card to buy groceries. And things continued after that until there were checks bouncing and an audit was called and they discovered that she had spent $30,000 of the PTO money on herself and her family. And part of it was for those things like the uh, food and the trash. Part of it was a trip to Disney for the entire family. Uh, part of it was for hockey equipment and the uh, hockey practices and the fees that you have to enroll her children in hockey. And uh, she was sentenced to three years in prison, but it, it might be commuted um, if she's able to meet the criteria that the court set down. She didn't even realize, you know, that she was running with the devil, but eventually she had hell to pay, didn't she? There are these great, big, ugly temptations that we hear a lot about. You know, the temptation to steal money or embezzle money, the temptation to cheat on a spouse, um, the temptation to lie when you get caught doing something you're not supposed to, and the temptation um, that comes from addiction. And some of us grapple and contend with those kinds of big ten temptations in our lives or, or the temptations that of others that we love have had. And we contend with it all the time. And we look every day for the spiritual strength. You know, Lord God, Jesus, just give me the strength to outpace the devil today. I'm running as hard as I can and it feels like he's catching up on my heels and I don't know what I'm going to do. Help me, Jesus, you know? That's sometimes how we deal with that kind of temptation. And, and the promise is that Jesus is going to help us. And sometimes it comes in forms that we don't want or expect, but I'll tell you, Jesus is going to help us when we face temptations like that and we cry out for help. The angels will take us on their wings and will transport us to a different place. But you know, there are other kinds of temptations that we face every single day that we don't even realize are temptations. There's a woman named Donna Hicks and she wrote a book called Dignity and she called it 10 Temptations to Violate Dignity. And these temptations damage the relationships that we have with each other. They damage the heart of the community. These little temptations that you and I face every single day. And one of the temptations we talked about earlier was uh, the temptation to create false dignity. And what she says that is, is doing stuff so people will think we're great people and they'll like us, not doing it, you know, for the authentic reason of caring about another person or caring about God or caring about our work, doing it just so we look better. The temptation to create false dignity. Another temptation she talks about is the temptation to save face. Like when we do something wrong, instead of owning up to it, you know, 
creating lies or prevarications just so we don't get caught. And every single one of us is human. You know, there are no superheroes among us. Not one of us, you know, is anything more or less than human. That's what we are. And we're going to make mistakes. And we have to be patient with each other and be able to forgive each other for those mistakes. And, and also, we have to own up to it and say, wow, I did it. And I feel bad that I did it. I'm really sorry. I want to try to fix it. And I want to learn from what I did. So it's the temptation to save face. She has 10 of these, and I'm not going to go into all of them. But another one I think is really tough is she calls it uh, the temptation to create intimacy through gossip. Like sometimes we're tempted to connect with another person by speaking badly about a third person. You know, we're tempted to develop a relationship and get closer to someone by pointing to another person and saying, look at them, we don't do it like that. And uh, Donna Hicks says, it's one of the 10 temptations that violate dignity. And you know, just in little ways, it happens so often. We, we don't do it on purpose, usually. But when we catch ourselves in it, it's like, oh, oh God, why did I do that? Oh Jesus, help me. <laughs> help me to have an authentic friendship rather than one based on excluding somebody else or putting somebody else down or denigrating somebody else. And the last temptation I'm going to talk about this morning is uh, the temptation to uh, respond, to take the bait. The temptation to take the bait. Take the bait. That's the hardest one, you know? Like when someone exhibits bad behavior toward you or toward me, and we use it as an excuse to give the same thing back. You know, oh, well, it's kids. Oh, well, he or she started it. Oh, well, I, you know, swore at that person on the road because they were swearing at me or whatever. They did something. They cut me off. Or uh, I, I see people looking around at each other for this one. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to name, uh, but uh, yeah, I confess I've, I've taken the bait. I've taken the bait on occasion, but you know, it's a temptation. It's running with the devil. All these things may seem like they're minor, but they're all running with the devil. And they take a little chunk out of our soul and spirit when we participate. And it's incredibly difficult to walk this narrow way, to walk this narrow way that Christ calls us to, or loving God and loving our neighbor and loving our enemies, to not take the bait, to respond to someone and they're being a complete idiot to us with care and kindness and gentleness. It takes spiritual discipline, but, you know, it's what Christ calls us to do. And when we're able to do it, we zoom, we zoom, we so outpace the devil. And eventually we discover, you know, the grace and peace and possibility that Christ gives to all of us. So, you know, every single day we are running with the devil. But when we're able to walk with Jesus, we have renewed energy and strength to say, get thee away from me, Satan. Get out of here, because I got better things to do today. When we have communion, Amber, raise your hand, Amber, is going to give you a stone. It's for you to take home with you and for you to put in a place that you see every day or it's some place you touch all the time. And every time you touch it, just think about, you know, what am I tempted to do that Jesus wouldn't want me to do? Or 
how can I live more fully in love? Or how can you be more integrated into my life, Jesus? And I promise you that by the end of Lent, your soul will be strengthened and will be able to face so much. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Let us join together in the hymn.